There were signs of peculiarity, which I think has a great deal to do with writing. Uh, my family, I think like most families, was very strange. Uh, my father ran away from home in the town where he was born, Gordonsville, Virginia, which is on the West Virginia border. Ran away when he was 14. For the next 14 years, he was a cowboy in Idaho. And then he went back east. Uh, I had an aunt, his younger sister, who was an amateur actress. Uh, and that is sort of a misnomer because she was acting all the time. She's a very interesting woman and very strange. And she was the first woman I ever knew in my life who smoked a cigarette and who had her hair bobbed. My father had a brother, my uncle, who was the absolute most demonized religious fanatic I've ever known. That was my father's side. My grandfather, his father, had a farm in Gordonsville and apparently during the winter had some sort of store at some crossroads, probably the only crossroads in town. And on my mother's side, there were equal peculiarities. I had an uncle who uh, had studied to be a nautical engineer. His first job, which was surveying the Chesapeake Bay, caught diphtheria and was totally deaf and had to give up his profession. And he went into business, but he was a pretty good, again, amateur portraitist. He was a pretty good painter. Uh, I have another uncle with whom I was very fond uh, toward whom I was very fond, who uh, was the first person I ever knew who had an athletic scholarship. His was basketball to the University of Maryland. Uh, he majored in agriculture. He wanted to be a farmer. He never had money to buy a farm. So he stayed around and became a lawyer, didn't like that, and invented an aluminum horseshoe used by thoroughbreds on racetracks and made a lot of money doing that. My mother was the world's worst cook. I shouldn't say that. She was just the worst cook I ever knew, mostly because she would stand at a stove doing whatever she was supposed to do, but reading constantly, and paying no attention whatsoever to whatever was on the stove, and everything was always burned to the degree that when I went into the Marine Corps, I thought it was the best food I ever tasted in my life. I wrote constantly as a little boy. The first thing I wrote that was published was at 14 when my uncle was putting out some kind of brochure about his racing plates, these aluminum horseshoes. And he asked me to work with him and I wrote the jokes and a kind of narrative, and it rather surprised me to see it in print. So that was the first thing I ever wrote, and the first thing I ever wrote that I never got paid for. When I got out of high school during the Depression, I was a seaman aboard merchant ships, freighters, and I loved that too. But it was a rather unnatural life. I realized it didn't take me long that I could do this the rest of my life, but I would do it without a wife or children. I would do it without a job on solid land. And so reluctantly, I quit it and went to college. Where did you go to college? Johns Hopkins, which was a great place. I still uh, am active in Hopkins affairs. I just wrote a piece about Black Rock. They asked me to write about Black Rock for a literary magazine they have. It's a very good magazine. It's a very good school, and the people in it were very good teachers. And the people who were students were very nice, too. I enjoyed it very much. I had spent a year before, I, when 
when I was a seaman, I had decided that once I couldn't keep this up for a lifetime, that I would apply to college. So I applied to Hopkins and to Harvard. I was accepted at both. And then we had a fire aboard the ship in a place called Middlesbrough, England, on the North Sea. Little town, but it delayed us three weeks. So by the time we got back to the States, I asked the master of the ship if I could get off in Boston to go to Harvard. And first of all, he thought this was laughable. He thought I'd never been to any kind of school in my life. But I showed him this thing I had gotten from Harvard and from Hopkins. And um, reluctantly, he let me go. Not that I was such a good seaman, but it was additional trouble picking up hands unnecessarily. So I went over to Cambridge, and I saw somebody in an executive position, I don't know who it was, at Harvard, who said, fine, but the school year's already started. Come back next year. So what was I going to do? I had a whole gear on my hand. I was on my way. I went to Hopkins. They said the same thing. Come back next year. The school year had started. I was on my way to see a friend in Washington. By this time, going down to Baltimore, where I was born and raised. And I was on my way to Washington, and I saw this absolutely beautiful school at a place called College Park, Maryland, which was just about equidistant from Baltimore and Washington. So I thought, why not? So I went there, and they accepted me. Uh, those days, the University of Maryland, which is not nearly as good as it is today, it's a very good school today, but it wasn't in those days. As a matter of fact, it was like an extension of high school and a big boor. But I went there for a year, and I didn't like it. That's when I transferred to Hopkins, which I loved. The first newspaper job I had was on a paper called the Mount Vernon Daily Argus, which of course was called the Mount Vernon Daily Anguish. It was owned by the Macy chain in Westchester. And this was the first truly independent, if you can say that, newspaper job I ever had. And I loved it. I remember the first day I was hired, and I would work at times 18 hours a day in those days. But that first night, I went to a police station to get some information. I covered police in the North Bronx of New York. And I remember that the office was maybe two or three miles from the police station, which was in New York. And we were across the line in Westchester. And after leaving that police station, I remember strongly to this moment my exhilaration in being hired to write by a daily newspaper. And I ran, it was like midnight, I ran all the way back from the police station to the office to write my story. And that was wonderful. And I would have gone back to New York after the war, except uh, I had malaria and dengue fever, and I didn't want to cope with the summer and winter climate of that area. So I stayed out here. And as long as I was here, I thought I'd try pictures. And I did. The first job I had in Hollywood was with United Productions of America, which was a spin-off of Disney, made up of a group of people who had gone out on a strike and had immediately been fired by Walt. Uh, I don't know why I used his first name. I didn't know him. I didn't have any desire whatsoever to know him because that kind of person it seemed to me he was. So these guys, breaking away from Disney, formed their own company, United Productions of America. And uh, I was doing the usual cartoon foolishness for them, which was made up, as all cartoons at that time were, of something called hurt gags. 
which was one hurt gag after another. That is a situation which presumably was supposed to be funny and it was everybody picking on whoever the protagonist was until the last 30 seconds of the six minute picture. Situation was reversed and the person they were picking on would emerge triumphant like Bugs Bunny, for example. Uh, there was an excellent animated director at UPA named John Hubley, H-U-B as in Bernie, L-E-Y, and he and I enjoyed working together. As a matter of fact, we spent a great deal of time outside the office together. When I first came down here, we had no place to live. Everything was terribly overcrowded. And so my wife and I lived with John and his wife. Anyway, I went to John and I said, you know, we could do a cartoon. We could do an animation picture that isn't made up of hurt gags, that has a beginning, middle, and an end, and it's a story, like a short, short story. And he said, let's try it. So I came up with the idea with Magoo, and that's what we did. My first assignment came out, not of anything I wrote, came out of my being in the Marine Corps, because Dory Sherry, who was head of MGM, had a thing about Marines. He was too old to enter World War II himself, but the idea that I had been a Marine in combat appealed to him, and it was called Take the High Ground. And from then on, I was in business because with this first picture, I got an Academy nomination, and I was in the business. It came about because Art Buckwald had done a picture essay for the old Life magazine called The Making of a Marine. And it was about Marines going through boot camp. And Dory had asked me to do this because I had been in the Marine Corps. Uh, we went to the Marine Corps to get a place to shoot it. And at the time, the Marine Corps was trying to appeal in a public relations response to kids in order for them to join. And they had had a reputation of being terribly tough. And they thought they'd better ease up a little. On the other hand, the Army was trying to be tougher. So the Marine Corps turned us down because they thought this was pretty rough. But the Army picked it up. So instead of doing a picture about the Marine Corps, I was, I'd ended up writing a picture about the Army, and that's high ground, which got the Academy nomination. Black Rock was a kind of interesting because It began as a total mess. Now, usually, as you know, when you do a picture, sometime, usually by the time you get to the, the middle of the second act, it's a mess you have to clean up. This mess began before the picture did. Uh, a very good writer named Charlie Schnee was going to produce it, and uh, a director named Richard Brooks was going to direct it, and I was going to write it. It was based, or came about because people at MGM at the moment were wild because they had to give Spencer Tracy something to do, and it was his choice entirely as to whether he wanted to do it or to reject it and they had nothing for him, which meant that for doing nothing, they'd have to pay him a tremendous amount of money. And this they found very disturbing. And Dory remembered that about six months earlier, something had crossed his desk called Bad Time at Hondo, which was a, a pretty poor screenplay written from a very good short story by Howard Breslin called bad time at Hondo. Uh, and that he thought might interest Spence. 
It did to the degree that Spence said he certainly was interested, and that's when Charlie was signed on as a producer, and uh, Brooks was signed on as a director, and they asked me to do the screenplay. Fine. Before I started, I got a call from Brooks who wanted to talk with me, and he was very upset about the whole procedure in that he apparently was disturbed by the fact that there existed the Un-American Activities Committee, and they were coming after both Dory and me for various different reasons. And he apparently felt that he would be in a period or in an area of deep jeopardy if he agreed to do this. And he had called me down to talk with me, trying to dissuade me from taking it on. And I told him no, that I wanted to do it. I thought it would be a good idea to go up against these people in Congress who were trying their best to defeat the Bill of Rights. And when he saw that I wouldn't go along with him, he picks up a telephone, he dials, and he says, Spencer, this is Richard. Uh, Mill and I are working on this thing, but don't expect anything. It's garbage. So he hung up, and I said to him, what are you doing? We need Tracy for the picture. And before he could answer, if indeed he had an answer, Dory called and said, what's going on down there? The Tracy had called him, was coming into the office immediately, and he wanted us up there. Tracy comes in. He says, Brooks said the thing is garbage. He doesn't want to do it. Where he wings a story to him, which was a great deal like the one we'd all rejected, and now Spence rejects it. So Charlie quits, Brooks is fired. I go back to my office to pick up whatever junk I had to go home. The phone rings, and the door he said, Let's start from scratch. You write it, I'll produce it, and we'll get a director. And he got John Sturgis, who was a very good director. And that's how that began. The short story was quite different from what went on the screen as Bad Time, Bad Day at Black Rock. Uh, even the title I changed because for two reasons. First of all, Bad Time did not give me what I wanted, which was a unity of, of time and a unity of place. So I changed it to Bad Day. Uh, we couldn't use the term, and didn't want to, Honda, because John Wayne was coming out, and we knew about it, with a picture which would certainly be out before we were, called Hondo. Uh, Black Rock was the name of a town, an insignificant, tiny town I had happened to pass through on another picture about a year earlier. And I thought the name, if not the actual town, would have been very good for the title of this picture. So I changed it from Hondo to Black Rock. The short story was very brief. And I really don't remember too much about it, except that in order to do the picture, we required a three-act form, which was absent when I first saw that short story. And so I, I built the thing up until it became what it was. The precise development, I can't tell you, I don't know what I'm doing. Everything I do in terms of writing stems from my unconscious, really. I just sit down and let it fly. There was, at the time I was doing Black Rock, a newspaper that appeared I believe weekly, called Red Channels, which was put out by two former FBI agents. And having retired from the FBI, this is what they did. The picture was made up of nothing more, I beg your pardon, the newspaper was made up of nothing more than a series of names with accusations about the people mentioned with no form of proof or anything else. And Eddie Mannix, who was an executive at MGM, and a guy who, despite 
at times a difficult reputation I liked very much. I found him extremely enjoyable to be with. Eddie called me and said, you want to step up here for a minute? I go up his office and he's got a copy of Red Channels and he says, have you seen this? Well, of course, I never read the thing. So there's my name and it says that I had circulated a petition for Albert Maltz, who was another one of the Hollywood Ten, among writers mostly in the Guild, because Albert had written a novel. He was a friend of mine. He had written a novel called uh, The Journey of Simon McKeever, which was a rather mild, sentimental story about an elderly man with arthritis who hears a rumor that some woman doctor in the Deep South can uh, correct this difficulty. And it's a story of how he walks from, I think it was New England, deep into the South, trying to find this woman who, of course, can't help him. But it was a very good novel. Zanuck had bought this, but when Albert was accused and was numbered among the Hollywood Ten, Zanuck simply took the novel and deep-sixed it. He buried the thing. He still had paid for it, but a very small amount of money, which would have been due to Albert once the thing was completed on screen. During this interval, after Albert was named, while Zanuck had this story, a company in London wanted to do it. And they wanted to buy it from Zanuck. But Zanuck wouldn't sell it to him. He was perfectly happy in keeping the thing undercover that way. He never wanted anything that Albert had done because of the circumstances to be produced. So. I had circulated, and I believe there were others. I was not alone, but I don't remember who it could possibly have been. I circulated a petition, uh, a rather a letter addressed to Zanuck, respectfully requesting him to return Albert's novel to the man who wrote it so that he could sell it in London, and he had refused. That's where it stood, and I was picked up in red channels by their saying that I had circulated a petition for a guy who was one of the Hollywood Ten. The other thing they had on me, there were two things. The second was they said that my father, whose name was Frederick Kaufman, as indeed my son has been named after him, uh, that Frederick Kaufman had been a known, outspoken communist in Seattle and that he was at the moment heading a railroad strike. And again, this business of the, in the name of communism or some kind of thing. Okay, now that was very peculiar. I knew my father had in his travels throughout the West after he had left uh, Idaho as a cowboy, had been in Seattle. But I knew also that, A, my father was a card-carrying Republican and that he hated railroads because of his time as a cowboy and they're fencing him in. So something was funny. Uh, I said to Eddie, I didn't know anything, didn't know what the hell to do. So I said to Eddie, can you recommend a lawyer? And he said, yeah, there's a guy in Beverly Hills and so forth and so on. So. He called the guy, the guy said, come over. I went over to see him. And he said, let me draw up something and come back the next day. So I did, and what he showed me, drawn up, which he expected me to sign, was something utterly preposterous. The fact that I was a member of the Communist Party, I had become a member of the Communist Party in the Marine Corps, which in itself was absurd, and that I had been in combat and therefore I didn't know what I was doing. I was so depressed and disturbed by what I had seen during the war. So I said, no, I'm not going to sign this and I'm going to tear it up in your presence because I don't want this damn thing to appear 
before anybody at any time ever. And I tore the thing up and I said, what do I owe you? He said, a hundred bucks. So I gave him a hundred bucks and walked out. Uh, this was at a time when a hundred bucks was worth a great bit more than it is now, but it still was a moderate fee. It was nothing. Now, what am I going to do? Here I stand accused. Uh, my name appears in red channels. This is going to be the beginning, unless it's snuffed up somehow. So I really didn't know who to go to except the guy who represented the Hollywood Ten, Ben Margolis, whom I didn't know, but who certainly was doing a very good job, I thought, in attempting to protect these Ten from further outrage. So I went to Margolis, I told him what had happened, I told him about my father, and he said, well, give me about 24 hours. I'll call somebody in Seattle and find out what they're talking about. So the next morning at about 8 in the morning, he woke me, and he's laughing. He thinks it's terribly funny. In the meantime, I, didn't, I don't think it's funny at all. I'm in a terrible spot. But Margolis calls me, he's laughing, and he said he got in touch with somebody in Seattle. And it is true that there was a Fred Kaufman who was a known communist, who was head of a railroad union, who had called a strike, except it was a strike of Pullman Porters. The guy was black. Now, that of course got me off, and I went back to Eddie, and I said, Eddie, you've been very good about this, but I'm going to sue you sons of bitches for $5 million which was a lot of money. And Eddie said, why don't we just forget it, come on back to work, and so forth. So I did, and that's all there was to it. But that was a, a terribly annoying incident. I was a front on one occasion for Trumbo. He had gone to jail, he had gotten out, and I got a call from my agent George Wilner, who was a very good agent and a very nice man, who it turns out was uh, Trombo's agent. I hardly knew Trombo. I had met him once, quite by accident, in a bar next to where a screenwriting meeting was being held at the Hotel Roosevelt in Hollywood. And a terrible mistake had been made that night at the Writers Guild meeting. Somebody's idea, which was carried out, was to install microphones. And you give a, a writer a microphone, you can't get them off. And so it was a terribly boring evening. So I wandered out of there into the bar next door, and apparently Trombo, uh, whom I recognized but didn't know, had reacted the same way. And we, it was very crowded in the bar, and we found that we were fairly close together. There was a guy between us who was not a writer, but who was a, a drunk. And he was deep into the stuff, and he said to no one in particular, uh, what's all that noise? And either Trombo or I, I forgot, I forget, said, it's a writer's meeting. And the man said, what do those guys write? And either Trombo or I said, they write movies. And the guy looked at me as if he couldn't comprehend the answer that had been given to me. He said, you mean they write that stuff? And that's how I met Trombo. Now, he had this job to rewrite a thing that apparently had been started by McKinley Canner. I forget the name of it. It'll come to me, possibly. But anyway, uh, Trombo was hired to do this, but he couldn't use his own name. And as we shared the same uh, agent, George, the agent, called me and asked me if I would do this. And I said, I don't know, that I'd have to talk to my wife and I wanted to think it over. And George said, well, you kind of got to hurry about this because unless we can tell these people that we have a name for Trombo, uh, he's not going to be able to get the job. And I hit the ceiling. I said, you're asking me to do something that could possibly land me in jail. 
I said, I have two young kids and two old dogs, and uh, I want to talk it over with my wife. And then, of course, he apologized for attempting to hurry me. I went and talked to my wife, and we agreed that I would do it, and I did. I was at MGM between the late 40s and I suppose it was the early 60s. But one of the problems I ran into, which I didn't realize, of course, at the time, was a problem. After my first picture and my getting an Academy nomination, somebody came up with a good idea that I would be a good person to handle a bunch of pictures they didn't know what to do with, which were never made and which needed work and could possibly be turned into pictures and film made into movies. So they gave me an awful lot of stuff, which was kind of middle of the road. It was too good to be just thrown out and not good enough to be filmed. So I would work on these things and make them uh, shootable. And this was done for a long period of time for which I got a lot of money. and. I wouldn't take credit for this because other people had really written them. And I spent a lot of time doing that. Script doctoring is exactly what it was. But at that time, so far as I know, although I must be wrong, I was going to say that I didn't know anybody else who was doing this, but I guess there were people that kept it as secret as I did. At MGM, where I spent most of my time, it was generally agreed that you walk in when you want and you leave when you want and nobody pays any attention to it. But having been there so long, somewhere along the line, I found out that as soon as you walked in, they put down the time. And when they left, when you left, they put down the time. So they knew exactly how much time you were putting in. And also it was embarrassing at one point because a producer a young man I knew was fired. And one of the reasons they gave was the fact that he didn't spend as much time as they thought he possibly should working at the studio. That was their business. What was rotten was that they told him that I come in at nine and I leave at five, which made him understandably hate me, <laughs> you know. Uh, they can talk all they want about what they want, but they can't talk as much as they want about what I did. That's my business. But most of the time, MGM comparatively was very good because Dory was such a really great guy. You wrote Aladdin and his lamp. Well, you were one of oh, a yeah. bunch of writers on that. Or um, Talk well, about that for a minute, Aladdin. I'd love to talk about that, except that I've forgotten just about the whole thing. What I remember was that another jailhouse scene, uh, the producer of the thing had just gotten out of jail. He later did the Taylor picture about Cleopatra, Walter Wanger, and he had just gotten out of jail. He was in jail because he had taken his shot at an executive at Universal who he thought was messing around with his wife, Constance Bennett. Uh, he gets out of jail. He wants to do this thing. I'm hired. It was terrible. And I remember our taking it to Pasadena for a preview, and although both of us agreed that it wasn't a terribly good picture, that was high praise to the reaction of the people in the theater in Pasadena that night. And he let us know. And Walter turned to me in the midst of all this booing and yelled in my ear, maybe I should have stayed in jail. And that's what I mostly remember about that picture. Never So Few was adapted from a very good book by a man named Tom Shimalis, who uh, had written this thing, MGM bought it, and I was assigned to write the screenplay, and I generally followed the book. It was a good story. And I believe Sinatra was in it, I don't remember. Yeah, 
and his whole bunch, he had a lot of his friends. It was the first picture that I believe McQueen had ever done. And that happened because Sinatra came to my office one day before we started shooting and referring to a certain character said, you know, this would be a hell of a part for Sammy Davis. Sam had never done a picture before that. Later, when I directed a picture, I used him. But at that time, he had done nothing on screen. And I thought that was a very good idea. And we called in Sturgis, who directed the thing, and told him about it. And I thought that it would be a good idea to go and see Saul Siegel, who had succeeded Dory as head of MGM. So the three of us go to see Siegel, and Frank suggests rather strongly, and he had a lot of muscle, that uh, Sam be used for this part. And uh, Saul, I think, was pretty reluctant about this, and he didn't give anything that could be interpreted as a positive reaction. So we came back to my office and Frank said, what are we going to do? And I said, well, uh, he didn't say no, he didn't say anything. Why don't we assume that his silence concurred with us in agreeing to have Sam? Let's assume that Sammy is in the picture. And Frank said, well, what do we do about that? I said, well, call him and tell him to send his agent in and see if we can move this forward. Uh, we called and Sam was out of town. He was in Chicago. We didn't know where. But it was quite obvious that if he were in Chicago, he would be seeing a guy who had, I think, a radio program there at the time named Irv Copsonet. So we called Copsonet to ask if he had seen Sammy, and it was a dinner, and his dinner guest was Sammy. So everybody was quite delighted about that, and then Cupsonette was going to use Sammy on a radio program which followed dinner. The next morning, Frank gets a call from one of his spies, and he had him everywhere in Chicago, saying, that great friend of yours, Sam Davis, really fixed your wagon last night. It turned out that Sam, on Cupsonette's show, was doing marvelous invita uh, imitations of Frank. And Frank somehow found this uh, unattractive. So now he comes to my, office, to my office and he says, let's get rid of Sam. And I said, the hell with that. I said, you brought up the idea of being in the picture. I agreed with you. If you want to get rid of him, you get rid of him. And he did. All right. About two days go by, and it's a Saturday night. And my wife and I were going to go to Shari's for dinner. And she said to me, take a look at the kids. I think they're looking at television. I should be, they should be having dinner. So I'm half shaved, I go to see the kids, and indeed they're watching television, they're not eating. And about a half hour later, my wife calls and says, what are you doing? I was fascinated, I had never seen this thing before, by this young man on screen. He became a big star, but anyway, this was his first picture, and he was on the picture because of that. Steve McQueen. Steve McQueen, thank you. You directed a picture. So yes. tell us about that. Well, what was it called? It was called Reprieve, and on television, at times, it had a second title, which was Convicts 4. Uh, ben Gazzara was in it, and a lot of other very good people. And I have a tendency to forget names, so I don't know who they were. However, it was kind of interesting because, as we're all aware, one of the things that writers invariably fall back on in order to make sure their precious words are preserved 
is they'll direct it themselves, the director doesn't make any changes. And so I looked forward to directing this picture, and unhappily, I hated every minute of it. I couldn't stand hanging around a filthy set, waiting while somebody arranged lights that could take all day at times. That's an exaggeration. What I'm trying to say is I didn't like it at all, and uh, in a way this was very unfortunate, because if I had stayed with it, uh, I would have made a great deal more money for my family and that sort of thing. However, uh, I wasn't the least bit interested after that in directing. I didn't like the, the idea, basically because I found that I was essentially not terribly good at telling people what to do in public. I much preferred being in the privacy of a dark room with a light over a desk and totally alone writing. And that's what I've always preferred, and for that matter still do, which is why I wrote this book, because I don't see anybody on the horizon eager to hire me as a writer of movies anymore. The Warlord was starring Charlton Heston, who was one of the most difficult people I have ever known in terms of attempting a collaboration on a movie for a very simple reason. And I found out only because somebody in his office blabbed and told me about it while I was writing and passing pages to him because it was his company and he was the producer as well as the star, he would constantly rewrite me. And like almost everybody who works by pulse beat, he thinks that whatever he turns out is superior to what, say, a professional writer would turn out. And there's a constancy in this everywhere. People have a feeling that they know how to write and sometimes the best they can do is to dash off a letter or sign a check, but that doesn't stop them from trying. And it certainly didn't stop Chuck Heston, who was a pain in the neck, and finally I said, you gotta quit this. Well, he told me he would quit it, but of course he didn't, and uh, the picture wasn't terribly notable because I like to think, whether I'm right or wrong, of his rewriting me. You went to London to do Lots a project. Of times. Hmm? Uh, for a picture called uh, Living, Free. Living Free, which is about those adorable lions, which I'd never go near if I had any choice about it. And the picture was produced by Carl Foreman, who was very good to work with, very thoughtful, it was really enjoyable, a period of my life. I think my first agent was George Wilner, and that was at a time when agents were not at all difficult to get. It was before the agency took over the studios, which they have done and are doing now. Uh, how I met George Wilner, I don't know, I don't remember, it was at a party. But he immediately said, yeah, sure, you take me on, and he did, and he was very good. Later, there was one very, also another very good agent named Everett Ziegler, who was a great agent and a dear friend. And by that I mean, he not only performed well in his professional capacity as an agent, he was a funny, bright guy who was formerly a hockey goalie at Princeton. So he was pretty well rounded and he and George were the two favorite agents I've had and I guess I've had a dozen agents in my lifetime at least. So which one was the one that died? Her name was Doris Halsey. She many years before had been the widow of an outstanding agent whose name was Halsey, whom I knew just vaguely. And then 
when she came here from Europe and married Halsey, she became involved in his business and then took over his business after his death. And I was with her up until the time she died. What was the emphasis and the power and the muscle of the studios is now in the hands of the agencies who do the exact same thing in their own way as the studios used to do. The studios would sign people, for example, to act. And they would give them acting jobs. Now, when a, an agency takes over a procedure, it brings its own people in to write and direct and to act and do every other damn thing. They are studios. So the same procedure exists. It's just as rotten as it ever was.